Hello everyone, today um, we are going to talk with Dr. Jana Maranas, who is an Associate Professor of Penn State Chemical Engineering Department. Um, she completed her PhD from Princeton University and currently she is working on nanoscale structure and mobility in soft materials. Hello Jana. How Hi. are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good too. Mm -hmm. um, so, the main uh, goal of this interview, as I discussed with you earlier, that we always um, wonder about how the admission process of graduate students takes place here. And we want to explore that process and want to clear the misconception among <laughs> us <laughs> about it. Um, so before going into that details, I'd like to know about the research area you're working on. Okay. My um, research in, let's say, the past five years has really focused on alternative energy. Mm -hmm. So we do work in various areas of alternative energy, mostly uh, lithium-ion batteries, mm -hmm. and we also work on biofuels. I see. So um, when you're taking any students for your research group, what particular quality you look for in that student? Um, I look for several things. So the, the two things I think are most important is that someone's curious mm -hmm. and someone is um, teachable. Okay. So curious means that you naturally have a lot of questions or you can learn to ask questions because sure. research is all about asking questions, questions and figuring out the answers. And, and teachable means that um, you want to improve as a researcher and as a person and that you're open to hearing suggestions about how to make your performance or your work better. Yeah, sure. So how long have you been working in this um, graduate student selection company? I have done this for seven years. Oh, that's a long time. It is a long I, time. I'm sure you love the whole process. <laughs> that's Every student here was admitted by me. Uh, that's <laughs> cool, that's cool. So how do you feel working in this? I mean, in selecting students, what's your? Opinion? You know, I I enjoy doing it. I like reading the applications, and mm -hmm. I like working with grad students and thinking about our grad program and how it can be as good as possible. Okay, um, so the first thing probably I'm gonna ask is, what do you when you uh, receive an application, what do you look into that? What's the first thing you you check? So um, the way we see the applications, it's online. Mm -hmm. And so before we open it at all, you can see all of the numerical information mm -hmm. and things like what university someone went to, or what country of citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you already know test scores and yeah, GPA yeah, yeah. and stuff like that before you open the file. So when I open the file, I'm really looking for the letters mm -hmm. Um, and the statement of purpose. Those are I the see. two things that I look at when I open the file. Okay, so um, do you think CGPA is a main role, no. plays a main role? In Not at all. Not at all? Not at all. So, I mean, say someone is interested to get, admit, get admitted in Penn State, but um, he or she doesn't have the minimum requirement probably so how do you evaluate that? So we don't have a minimum requirement for GPA. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, clearly there's some expectation that someone going to graduate school would be yeah. one of the top students from yeah. their university. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a couple of answers to that question. So if someone's from a university where the GPA tends to always be lower, mm -hmm. it's really useful to get class rank. Yeah. And it's really useful for um, a professor to give class rank in a letter because anyone yeah. can write whatever they want on their resume or statement of purpose and there's no way to validate it. Yeah, that's sure. Correct. There are different standards of CGPA all yeah. over the world. Yeah. Um, so is there any way if someone has lower CGPA, maybe not lower than the mini minimum requirement, but lower CGPA, is there any way to make up that by other factors? Um, of course, yeah. So it's always a balance. Yeah. And, and you have to remember that we're looking for researchers. We're not yeah. looking for people who are good test takers. And yeah. so, um, but it, if it's very low, it does have to be addressed somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, so um, 
somewhere in one of the letters, someone needs to explain what circumstances were that led to that or you know, why they feel that this particular student would be good for research even though they were not a good classroom student. And even in the statement of purpose itself, it's useful to address that if, if the applicant thinks it's an issue. So, so what are other um, ingredients of statement of purpose is that, that you think important to address? I always tell people to write about themselves. Yeah. Um, usually I'm looking to get to know the person a little bit, mm -hmm. and I'm also looking to see how they write and express themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so what's not useful is to repeat all the numerical information that I can already see on the application. Yeah. Um, it's useful to give a little bit more information on why you want to go to graduate school, mm -hmm. you know, why you think that's a, a good fit for your career goals and interests and mm -hmm. um, you know anything relevant to the application that isn't anywhere else. Excellent. So what about the um, extracurricular activities that, that should be mentioned in the as well? That doesn't influence yeah. me one way or the okay. other about okay. a person. I know, we're interested in their ability to do science. And yeah. Actually, a lot of advisors might prefer that a student had no extracurricular activities <laughs> at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, sometimes uh, this quality is in a developed person as a researcher as well. It, it's something related to um, academic, then sometimes it helps us to um, build ourselves. The extracurricular yeah, activities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not recommending that people don't do that. I, yeah, I yeah, do yeah. it myself. But yeah, yeah. Um, I, that's not an uh, impact at all mm -hmm. when judging applicants. So um, now moving into the next, I think, important thing in application package, uh, GRE. So <laughs> yeah, we always have, especially for the international students, we always wonder how the GRE scores are evaluated because there is no um, cutoff score like IELTS or TOEFL in GRE. So how, what do you expect? Um, uh, so it, it varies with what part you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so obviously the quantitative part of the GRE is um, useful for chemical engineering and you know there's there's really you're looking for someone to be not too far below the average of chemical engineers which is 750. Mm -hmm. um, and if someone has a low GPA mm -hmm. that's one of the ways we can see you know, so they have a low GPA but a really high GRE quantitative score that mm -hmm. gives more confidence that yeah. that person will be able to handle coursework mm -hmm. in chemical engineering, graduate coursework. Okay. Um, apart from that, I, I just think if it's above the average, it's good enough. We don't distinguish between someone that has 780 and 800. Okay. Um, so you're talking about the old <laughs> scale of GRE. Yeah, well. I'm not used to thinking in the new <laughs> scale yet. <laughs> okay. Um, we can get an idea from that to a problem. Um, and um, now, what about uh, TOEFL and IELTS score? I mean, there are different modules in the... Maybe I should talk a little bit about the other parts of the GRE. Because we only talked about quantitative. Yeah, yeah, so, sure, sure. Uh, the one that I really like to use is the analytical writing part. I see. Uh, because I feel this is a part you can't really study for. Yes. But the other two parts you can study and do better, but the analytical writing part is, is really measuring someone's skill. Yeah. And I personally think that's an important skill yeah, for sure. graduate school. So I, I look at that pretty mm -hmm. carefully. Yeah. And um, for the verbal part, we usually don't care. Um, it shouldn't be really low. Yeah. Um, sure. But often international students are doing better than mm -hmm. U.S. students on the verbal part of GRE. I see. Um, and um, so, moving in back into the TOEFL and ads. So yeah, we can uh, you can judge our reading and writing skills from the TOEFL scores. Uh, but do you have any preference between TOEFL or ads? Um, I prefer TOEFL just because ninety nine percent of the applications that's what they have. I, I'm not used to looking at the others. I mean, it's just the method of. Um, or the score? It, it's interpreting the score. Okay. So yeah. 
the more data you have, the easier it is to know whether something is good or bad. Yeah, easier to compare between the applicants. Yeah, and, and I think I've had maybe 10 people that took that test in seven years. Okay, um, so um, is there any preference between the modules of TOEFL? Penn State has a minimum of 20 for the speaking part of yeah. the TOEFL, and mm -hmm. that's university-wide, so all students at the university have to have 20. Mm -hmm. um, you know, apart from that, I don't really examine each module individually, mm -hmm. and, you know, furthermore, each country has their own typical average for TOEFL, yeah. and so they're usually interpreted with respect to how people do from whatever country the application comes. I see. That, 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 I think that's a very good information that we are getting from you. Yeah. yeah. So a 90 in India is a bad score, and a 90 <laughs> in China is, is a pretty good score. I see. Let's talk about um, academic CV now. So what should, what do you expect in an academic CV? Because there are different formats. Yeah. Um, I expect that it should be in English. <laughs> Other than that, there isn't really any expectation, although when you look at how someone takes the time to format a CV, it does mm -hmm. get give you some idea of how detail-oriented a person is and how mm -hmm. careful they are. Um, and that is a useful skill in research. So mm -hmm. um, it's definitely useful to have it look professional and as if some time was put into yeah. working on it. Written with care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so as we also include research experience in our academic CV, and um, as you know, in different countries there are different scopes of research experience. Someone from Bangladesh might not get that much opportunity in, her, in their undergrad to do that much research. So what's, what kind of experience, I think, is useful, you think? In so, First of all, if you did research, definitely put it on the CV, definitely write about it in the statement of purpose, mm -hmm. and definitely ask the person you work with to write one of the letters. That's a huge red flag if there's not a letter from that person. I it, it says you didn't do well. Oh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you do come from a country where there's not a lot of opportunities for mm -hmm. research, put that in the statement of purpose. I you know, I know that in Bangladesh it, mm -hmm. it's not as common to be able to do undergraduate research, but mm -hmm. people in other universities might not know mm -hmm. that, and I don't know what the situation, there are some countries I just don't know about. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is kind of a tricky question, I guess. So when you receive thousands of applications, I'm sure there are applicants who has all those similar qualification or background, so how do you select someone from that situation? Um, it's easier than you might think. So the <laughs> numbers might be similar, there might be people with similar numbers, mm -hmm. but the you know letters from one person might be stronger, might mm -hmm. emphasize the, the things that are really important in research as opposed to, you know, this person was a good classroom student, which you need, but it's not everything you need for graduate school. Um, the statement of purpose can often be used to differentiate between mm -hmm. students with similar numerical. Yeah, sure. And um, so um, I think the letter of recommendation makes a big difference in this process. Sure. Yeah. So do you prefer um, online recommendation letter or it's okay if someone sends? We do everything online. At Penn State, yeah, everything yeah, yeah. is online. Um, yeah. You know, if someone cannot do that for some reason, they, mm -hmm. they can always send an email with the letter or even mail it to. Yeah. To I the mean, you'll cost your discussion pieces, I guess. If sure. <laughs> you know, as long as the letter gets into the file before I read it, I don't okay. care where it came from. So okay. if, if it comes as an email or if it comes through the mail, someone, staff person will scan it and put it into the application. Mm -hmm. So, um, talking about the deadlines, um, say someone couldn't just send the GRE or TOEFL score um, with a deadline, sometimes it happens. It does sometimes happen. Yeah, so, so how do you consider those applications? Uh, I would tell people not to worry about that. 
but when I look at applications, mm -hmm. um, if I find one that's a person I'm considering admitting and something is missing, I'll contact them and say, we don't have this, and then mm -hmm. you can explain the situation. I will say don't read files till all the letters are there. So that's really important. I'll read them if test scores are missing, but it, I think the letters are really important, so I don't yeah. read files with missing letters. I see. Okay. Yeah, sometimes we have this kind of question of your problem, your tense. <laughs> yeah. So um, this type of thing doesn't really influence that uh, admission decision, I guess. You know, if I can't have it by the time yeah. that I'm deciding, and mm -hmm. usually I, I look at applications by country, mm -hmm. and um, so when I'd be looking at them is, is different. But, you know, if I contact someone and I can't get that score mm -hmm. within a reasonable time, yeah, yeah. then it will influence their yeah. chances of admission. Sure. Um, so I have another question. Um, so sometimes we wait for a long time for getting the admission decision from the university, and it's like very usual that we apply to different universities, and sometimes people get offer from other university and they're waiting for their most favorite one. So would you suggest people um, for that case? Um, I can't speak to what happens at other universities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Penn State, I try really hard to have all admission decisions done by the end of February. Mm -hmm. And so um, usually if you're going to be admitted, you hear by the end of February. I, I do not think that's the case in, in other universities. Okay. Um, <clears throat> also, I start up a waiting list mm -hmm. and I inform everyone who's on the waiting list that they're on it, so I they see. know. Oh. Uh, but I, I don't think other other programs may not do that. Yeah. And, and so, um, if you're waiting past, let's say, middle of March, um, it's probably a good indicator that you were not in the first round of offers. Um, I certainly don't think it's wrong to contact mm -hmm. the person who's in charge of doing admissions and asking about the status of their yeah. application. I get lots of emails like that. Yeah, people uh, don't know much about it and they often um, hesitate to contact a person about <coughs> the decision they made. Yeah. It all has to do with how you write that email. Okay. So, you know, if you write it accusing the person of not having responded mm -hmm. to your application and demanding to know what the status is, you know, <laughs> that's not going to be received well. But if you write an email that's professional and, you know, explains why mm -hmm. you need to know, if you have another offer that you have mm -hmm. to respond to, I, I, nine it's, out of ten people <laughs> are going to take that just fine. Yeah, okay. So thanks a lot, Jenna, for sharing this with us. I think we're going to watch this video. We'll be <laughs> benefited through this. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Have a good day.